Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining this session. My name is Ariel Molino. I'm with the SunCup team based in Nairobi. The session that you have joined is Building Thriving Businesses for the Future, which is being hosted in collaboration with the Young Africa Leadership Initiative uh, and specifically their East Africa Regional Leadership Center. So thanks again for joining. And I will hand it over to our moderator for this morning, who is Kevin Zrandiak. Kevin, it's over to you. Thank you very much, Ariella. Thank you so much for that particular bit of uh, the introduction. Let's get this started. Good morning, ladies and gents. Good afternoon, uh, whichever place that uh, you're actually tuning in uh, this uh, morning. A very warm welcome to this particular segment themed around building thriving businesses uh, for the future. Just to put this into context uh, there, ladies and uh, gents that you're going to see in these particular sessions, are actually partners or rather have benefited from uh, the Young African Leadership Initiative uh, East Africa. And uh, to just uh, probably uh, set the ball rolling, this particular session has been co-curated by the Young African Leadership Initiative and the session in itself seeks to explore how the current global events that were actually shaped by the COVID pandemic have influenced how business is being done currently and uh, probably what this means to the next generations of leaders. And uh, basically, as we just to uh, get along with this particular session, I'm just asking you to uh, look at us as uh, storytellers. I mean, uh, it's not uh, uh, in the context that uh, we are brilliant, we are great, we know it all, but uh, it's about using our experience, using our personal day-to-day -day in our basis to just make you learn and uh, get something that uh, which you can integrate in your day-to-day -day in a uh, uh, process and in the process which will lead you to uh, defining or rather developing a thriving business if that's the path that you want to get into. Right, my name is Kevin uh, Randiek. You can check me out across all social media channels at Kevin Randiek is my name. And let me just use a Kiswahili word uh, that we use here in East Africa and specifically probably Kenya, Karibuni Sana, which is a Kiswahili word meaning welcome to you all. Allow me to probably just uh, put this into detailed context. The COVID pandemic forever changed the way uh, we do our businesses, right? From uh, probably uh, virtual streaming as we're doing right now, courtesy of uh, Sankalp to uh, not going to the office anymore as probably it was uh, in, uh, in the past days. This not to mention uh, uh, supply chain strengths were actually uh, influenced. I mean, uh, the system and uh, probably basic standard way of uh, doing education changed where there's uh, so much model around not only the physical learning episodes, but also uh, the digital learning uh, platforms. And to just also uh, explore this in a much more deeper and uh, detailed uh, way is, uh, let me see, one, two, three, four, counting it uh, uh, randomly, is one lady who is uh, a spectacular champion when it comes to education matters. We also have a gentleman uh, who uh, is uh, playing a key role in uh, shaping the agro-processing uh, uh, bits, whereby he is actually practicing poultry farming. And also, uh, to put it uh, further into context, is uh, a great, incredible young lady who is uh, defining trends when it comes uh, to the creative and uh, film industry uh, uh, sector. And uh, these uh, ladies and uh, gents in uh, this uh, particular room are uh, just going to, uh, I mean, uh, please feel free to engage. Uh, feel free to uh, share a question if I told you feel uh, there's something interesting uh, that uh, emerges uh, out of it. Try to understand from them how are they trying to uh, define and uh, remodel the status quo within their respective segments that they are in. And I think with that particular many words and uh, context along me to get it started by just bringing on board uh, Felicia Masaki. Felicia, hi, good morning. Uh, allow me to also maybe just break the rules and say Shikamo kwa lugha Kiswahili, which is hi in English. Felicia, what's up? Good morning. Take it away and just probably bring into context what this session is all about. Good morning, Kevin. Thank you so much for the good introduction. I hope you can hear me well. Yeah, perfectly and sound. Oh. Thank you. 
greatly, greatly. So uh, first of all, just want to say thank you to this uh, Sankov uh, Global Platform for just bringing us together, but also for Yali, uh, East Africa. And my name is Felicia, as I'm already introduced. So just a quick uh, intro about me. I work in the education sector and I am a director of the organization called Mimi Ninani. Uh, that's Swahili for Who Am I? So it's a pan-African human capital development that works to equip the young generation uh, with the set of skills to help them to be more of problem solvers, more of uh, opportunity creators and change makers. So how we do it is we develop set of programs that work across uh, uh, personal development and mindset change, but also across professional development and career, but also in the area of leadership and uh, business and entrepreneurship. And our target groups are kind of segmented into uh, the preteens who are like 10 years to 12 and then teenagers and then the working professionals as well as um, their support system in the ecosystem. So we work with parents and educators as well. So and then we work to also kind of inform the policy and things like that through research. So the kind of data and implementation we kind of uh, inform uh, uh, those who make policies. So that's that's around uh, what we do. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here that we're talking about thriving businesses. Uh, I've been through a journey <laughs> with, as you, you talked about COVID, uh, I, 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 I've seen it uh, through affecting not just the, 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 the target that I'm, I'm, I'm working with, the target group, but also myself through the journey in terms of looking at my strategy implementation and kind of uh, see how I could pivot to adapt and 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 move forward so um thank you all right uh, uh, thank you felicia probably uh, allow me to extend a bit of uh, your time onto your introduction uh, you've uh, probably uh, just uh, brought in the context in terms of how covid has uh, uh, defined probably your way of uh, uh, maybe doing business and uh, probably how you're trying to pivot onto it uh, in uh, in detail, uh, we do understand that we know you champion a pan-African deal of uh, trying to capacity build young leaders uh, through uh, through Mimi Ninani. Uh, maybe uh, when you started, probably Mimi Ninani, uh, the COVID scenario had not emerged, right? Could yes. there be in any way how you could uh, highlight Mimi Ninani's vision when it was started? and uh, how it uh, relates to uh, the theme thriving, uh, building thriving uh, businesses uh, for the future. Sure, sure. Thanks, Kevin. So we are champions of SDG 4 and 8, which is about uh, quality education. We're looking at unveiling the whole power of education. So we're working with these young individuals who are in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the education system and then those who are in the workforce. So how do we equip those who are already in education to prepare them for the world of work, which is now changing drastically and the crisis of unemployment is huge. So we're looking at how we can impact them with those, the exposure, the experience, and the set of skills to inform them while they're in school and even when they're 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 out of the system to kind of uh, help them to adapt quickly so <laughs> that's why i was saying it's on the not just us as a business but also the people that we're working with so we have to be constantly informed with kind of um, programs, the kind of the curriculum and how to kind of shift with how the world is shifting because um, it's not the same anymore. And, and so we have to be well positioned. So uh, I would say in our delivery, so we have like activities um, throughout. So our delivery before COVID uh, was mostly in person. So we're doing a lot of in-person programs because <laughs> we, we weren't really ready to break through the culture of getting a uh, virtual fully virtual uh in in most of our programs but when covid came we had to look at how we could uh work towards having those platforms and, and even have more reach to more individuals across the continent so that helped um, us to look further and break through and have um, a, a wider reach but also in terms of our delivery how we package how we deliver our content with regards to what what is changing all right. Uh, she's talking there about content delivery as part of her introduction. I just want to throw something uh, to her last, uh, which will link me up to our greater participant, uh, or other panelists who have, whom you're about to bring in next. Delivery. You do some very, very interesting uh, video clips and uh, images. Uh, 
what spurs or rather what triggers your creativity? I mean, uh, uh, when you wake up uh, trying to probably pivot or rather share me mininani across uh, the different uh, platforms within the continent, you're using clips. Uh, you're trying to use uh, images. Uh, you're trying to use contents. How do you always go about it? Do you mind sharing? And uh, maybe that particular question links us up to whom we're about to see next. Uh, talking a bit of creativity, I mean, uh, how do you always go about it, Felicia? Well, I think uh, it's, 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 it's what the organization, one of our values is creativity. So we, we, we believe in that power that everybody has it, but it's just about unleashing it. So, but also we are, we're working with, with, with individuals who are young. So <laughs> we want our message to come across simply, but also in a way that it can be well um, received. So uh, we have a lot of different ways that just, you know, you can have a message, but how do you package it? But also we, the social media platforms also have, you know, they have, if you look at, uh, we look at the algorithm, which is kind of gives us feedback on how to best present what is 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 more preferred by the target group so it will give you like uh, if you send a video then this is how it, 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 it the response you get if you send a picture so things like that and so uh in as much as we don't we don't move away from the content it's about how you contextualize it to kind of fit with the target group that we you, you're trying to reach. So, and you want to get across a busy entrepreneur, you want to get across a busy student, or you want to get across uh, a parent. So you have to get to to to, to, to the mind of, of your user and and that message that you're trying to reach, uh, and then how would that uh, click or match with them uh, using the kind of uh, like the the channel that you're using and how you package it. So it's it's all of that and the strength within us and 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 and, and yeah it, it's it's fun to do that all right uh perfect uh, she's talking fun she's talking unleashing the power of our creativity i will put her on hold and we'll get back to her later on as we progress allow me to probably get into the bit of art feeling creative enterprise and uh, none other than coming in next mudoni waigua what's up good morning how are you? And uh, morning, maybe as Malaysia talks about unleashing the power of creativity, let me throw it onto you. And uh, maybe you could uh, put us into context on who you are, all you do around podcasting, how you unleash your creative art, and how is it being uh, as a woman within the creative and film sector. Mudoni, uh, the segment is all yours. Thank you so much, Kevin. And thank you, Felicia, for you know, touching on, on education. It's very interesting when you mentioned education and how you interact with young people, as a young child, honestly, I was so taken away by content. I would wake up early in the morning on Saturdays to go watch Sesame Street and I would drive everyone around me, you know, up the walls because each time I'm just watching Sesame Street. But the thing is this, why was I interested in Sesame Street is because of the creativity, how they were able to contextualize simple things like mathematics, how to be a good neighbor, how to be a good friend. And I just thought to myself, that's, there's a world that I want to participate in as a young girl, but I truly didn't know how to, to get there. But I just told myself, you know what, there's a world out there that I want to be a part of. So over the years, I studied whatever I needed to do. To believe it or not, I didn't study film or broadcasting. I studied um, business um, administration, which now is helping me in entrepreneurship. And over the years, I worked in advertising. I transitioned into a production company. And then at about my late 20s, I started a business with my sister, who's my co-founder, and we're in the space of graphic design and audiovisual production. So we started the business with the thought of, let us build on our strengths. We, she's strong in graphic design, I'm strong in production, being able to conceptualize ideas and bring them out into the world. So as COVID would have it, here we are being able to shoot on location, being able to go up and about, and then we're told we can't feel as filmmakers and as creatives. And it's like, what are we going to do with our time? But with that, what COVID did was make us realize that we can leverage on technology, that there was an increased use of digital media, that we can now create content that can be used on or can be consumed on mobile devices. So smartphones, 
simple Android devices, which have now been increased in across Africa because of the reduced cost and also the access of internet. So during the pandemic, we were, or rather we collaborated with Africa Union and Africa CDC to just share the importance of maintaining personal hygiene during the pandemic and also the importance of taking vaccinations. And with that, we ran a campaign on social media where we targeted Uganda and Rwanda. And it just showed the importance of social media and the usage of digital media. And with that campaign in Uganda, we reached over 19,000 people. And Rwanda, we reached over 16,000 people. And it just really solidified the importance that we leverage on technology. We use social media and also that we not get stuck in the old way of doing things, but how can we look for opportunities in the market? How can we look for um, ways to build up new technologies that can spear the, the growth of the industry and give creatives the opportunity for their work to be seen in the world? Wow, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mudoni. Uh, you've talked creative content, you've talked leveraging up on tech, uh, you've uh, also showcased impact uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, your regional uh, reach. Allow me to probably uh, uh, take you aback. Huh? So uh, you are a creative entrepreneur and um, you talk about your entity Nifty Works Plus Limited. Uh, reason why I'm maybe getting into that particular bit is to just make you explore your mind a bit. I know you do a lot of podcasts, so uh, did, uh, when you started up uh, uh, Nifty Works Plus, uh, did you start with the intent of uh, creating content within their podcasting world? And if not, what actually elicited that? And why do you actually call yourself a creative entrepreneur? Such a great question. When we started the business, we were all about you know doing everything you know when you're starting off something you want to do everything and anything so we had to zero in and figure out okay fine what's the business really strong at so we found ourselves creating documentaries for clients we found ourselves creating corporate videos we found ourselves creating tv shows where we were able to create a pan-african kids show that was broadcasted through zuku and which was about teaching kids life skills, teaching them how to be friendly. You know, the nitty gritty is for them to be a good friend, a good student, a good child. And that was captured in a show called Story Hadithi, where we produced 60 episodes. And sometimes when I think back on how we produce 60 episodes, it's like, wow, it's so important that we create stories that will truly, truly um, impact our continent and give you know, different segments, the, the right content for them to, to grow, to be entertained and educated. Now, for podcasting, it was something that we thought about, but it never really came across our plates where you're just like, let's just focus on what we need to do now, what is bringing in the money. But again, COVID happened. We were all locked in in our houses and I personally started a podcast and I told myself, you know what, I have extra time on my hands. Um, I have a background in voiceovers and I was like, let me use my voice for good. And it's been now two and a half years that I've been in the podcasting space, but it also signifies that during the pandemic, many other audio creatives, so the opportunity for them to share their voices. You know, podcasting gives the individual um, full control you can do whatever you want to do. You can create what, whatever you want to create. And you have the independence to share your story wherever you are in the world. So picking up a mobile device, pressing record, and publishing an episode, that's the power of podcasting. And it really is a space where youth can really tap into and really share their thoughts instead of waiting for someone to share their thoughts. It's just as simple as picking a mobile device and sharing whatever is on your heart, obviously making sure that you're doing it creatively and professionally, but there's such a room for growth in this podcasting space and Africa is the next frontier. And I hope people can truly plug in and 
see where they can partner with podcasters, partner with audio creatives. And you asked me, what makes me a creative? I think a creative is someone who can daydream any time of the day and be able to conceptualize that idea and execute it, be it in a film, be it in a book, be it in a podcast, be it in an animation. Be it in a dream, be it in a podcast, be it in an animation. Uh, I, I don't know, Mudoni, do you love uh, having a uh, chicken? Uh, I mean, uh, if uh, you're given a chance, will you be having chicken uh, each and every morning? Uh, can uh, eating chicken well, style your creative concept? Sorry? Let me be very, let me be transparent. Chickens and I are not friends. Ah. If I see it running across me, I'll run away. Uh-huh. <laughs> But eating it, I enjoy eating chicken. But tell me to catch it, tell me to stay next to it, I can't. Let me just be transparent, I cannot. Uh, all, all right, so uh, she she can't catch a chicken, but she can eat it. And uh, maybe at that particular bit, allow me to uh, put uh, uh, Mudoni on hold for her to actually have a, probably a, a, a cup of uh, water. And uh, in this particular instance, this particular bit of an introduction will not be sufficient without her having a piece of uh, a big cuckoo, as we call it. And uh, uh, the gentleman we are just about to bring in next is uh, a gentleman whom uh, I believe uh, uh, he's done a lot of stuff when it comes to really uh, the entrepreneurship uh, journey from uh, uh, capacity building sessions uh, around uh, entrepreneurs uh, is uh, also a segment that I'd known him up uh, about uh, in the past. But uh, here he is uh, talking about agro processing and uh, with such a deeper focus around uh, poultry farming. Uh, ladies and gents, uh, all present, let's probably plug in Mr. Stanley Mburu. Stan, hi. You've just heard from Udoni saying uh, he's scared of uh, catching chicken, but he's not scared of eating it. I don't know, probably just get it started, bro. I mean, who are you? Uh, why do you describe yourself as a serial entrepreneur? And uh, maybe just go into detail and uh, make us understand what Big Cook is all about. Stanley? All right. Thank you, Kevin. And uh, for, for Mudoni who fears chicken, um, I take the hassle of preparing the chicken for you. Uh, by way of introduction, um, I'm a former uh, Young Africa Leadership Initiative alumni, uh, cohort two. Uh, I also went on to join the, the Mandela Washington Fellowship Program, which just ended. Um, and I can attribute mainly my success to date to what it is that I've managed to learn from the Young Africa Leadership Initiative, and I will explain about it uh, later on. My entrepreneurship journey uh, starts way back, uh, ever since I was a young uh, kid, my father and mom were involved in, in the production of chicken as farmers. And over the years, they managed to take us through school. And it was only until when I graduated from my, uh, my college, or rather my university uh, education, that I looked uh, back and thought, why is it that my, my parents never quite made it uh, as, a, as farmers in the, in the production of chicken? Whereas at the same period of time, they had to, they supplied all these big uh, processors, which kept on becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. And I noticed that this was not just a problem that um, my parents had. Uh, in essence, it was a problem that was affecting most farmers um, in that generation. And so I applied my bit, you know, in my study into it, um, and basically came to, to the point where um, for, for you to grow chicken from day zero to when it is ready for, for consumption, it takes farmers that five to 42 days. <clears throat> During that time, they are the ones who invest the most, they work the hardest, yet they earn the least when it comes to the market side. So then I asked myself, despite all these uh, upcoming, up and coming uh, marketplaces online, why is it that uh, farmers are unable to take their chicken directly to the market? Because when you go to the regular supermarket, you find the chicken um, sold at an, an a ridiculous amount. Whereas what is received by the farmer is a fraction of that. In some cases, just a quarter of what uh, is uh, you find as a price pointed at, at the retail supermarket is what the farmer will get. And out of that particular point, uh, only 50 cents is, it, is what they make per, per chicken. Whereas on the minimum, um, these processors will make at least uh, two dollars, uh, three dollars, uh, on that same chicken. Now, my big challenge also was revealed when COVID pandemic um, hit, uh, and I remember on this special day on the March of 2020, when the president came on the screen and announced that indeed we are going to lock down um, hotels, 
to avert uh, the crowding of, uh, of the spaces as well as the transmission, the only transmission of COVID. Now, for those who deal with farming and farming live animals, you know you can't put a pause on it. And like manufacturing of, uh, of uh, you know, non-perishable goods, you can't quite put a pause on, on the growth of your fruits or, or your animals. Now, manufacturing um, on is so to avert you know the bed of your of your animals before you get uh, market to sell, you have to increase the amount of money you have to pay for for feeds. You have to to continue feeding those animals despite them going beyond the time that they were supposed to be slaughtered. And therein, I, I ask myself: so how long could you afford to do this, and at what benefit? Even if you keep on spending money on this chicken. The market will not buy the chicken at a bigger, at a higher price than they currently or they are used to, and so that was a, when we, we were hit by a fast loss, uh, where you know we went to this big uh, cold storage uh, company um, and we stored four thousand pieces of our chicken, and after about three months we went back to that same facility and realized that all our chicken had gone green, and. You know, for those who understand um, you know, cold storage, then you already know that that is a spoiled product. So then I asked myself then, you know, it kind of started making sense. The reason why these farmers are unable to get to the market is because despite them, there have been all these marketplaces where they can sell the chicken. The process of getting the live animal to, um, to your table is not, is not a straightforward way. Um, technology is one good thing, but then as we go along, we need to get into processing. We need to get into the infrastructure behind how do you get these live animals to come to a slaughterhouse? Then from a slaughterhouse, it's taken to uh, through a certain process, uh, either for chilling, for deep freezing, or for, uh, I mean, blast freezing, or, uh, you know, uh, sold as fresh. Then there's a transformation, uh, transport, transportation from the processing center all the way to the market. Then there's a point of then having to wait for the payments from the customers who are buying. Whereas you as a farmer, you need you paid, you invested the first and you pay for cash, you pay cash for every item that you pick. So in a nutshell, that is what we Cuckoo have been trying to do. We basically solve the processing handle, we provide uh, processing as a service, we provide we provide cold storage as a service and logistics. Uh, we've just gotten accredited by uh, the National Environment uh, and Management Authority. So sooner or later, you start seeing our uh, Bikuku branded uh, chicken uh, right at your doorstep. We don't work away. I do not produce all this chicken. Uh, I have a uh, great supplier network from the Bella World Cooperative Society, which is a cooperative I helped found uh, back in February 2021. And out of that, 250 farmers come together and discuss their challenges and brainstorm on ways to uh, solve some of these challenges. How do we get our chicken sold to the market? And uh, Bikuku is part of that solution. So over to you, Kevin, I guess. Yeah. Kevin, you're on mute. Well, sorry, I'll take that again. Uh, thank you for that, Stanley, uh, for, uh, I mean, uh, that really elaborate uh, uh, maybe description that you put across to uh, how I've just gone through the processing element to the infrastructure, to you even talking the whole conversations around the uh, cold chain and uh, uh, also mentioning the fact that uh, you are uh, actually uh, putting across the cold chain as, as a service. Uh, when you started up, you talked about leveraging on the platforms of uh, Yali and uh, Mandela, Washington, right? So I know, yes, you went to RLC, uh, that's uh, the Regional Leadership Center of East Africa as a cohort too, right? Uh, could you link your vision then and uh, your vision now after the MWF and uh, could uh, maybe putting into context uh, when you started, getting into a leadership program. Were you already thinking chicken? Uh, where exactly? I mean, yes, you've uh, brought in and highlighted in terms of why you decided to do it, but what triggered you into uh, getting into uh, poultry as a business? I, I mean, I don't know. I'll just wish to uh, ask that on behalf of the audience and anyone else who is interested. All right. Um, chicken was not my first thought. And uh, back in 2013, I was uh, enrolled at, uh, I was a uh, second year enrolled at Kenyatta University. And um, where the Young Africa Leadership Initiative uh, is housed, 
is a building that was uh, that is called the Chandari Innovation Center. And when I was in my second year, that building had not been built. Uh, and the, the, the Professor Muganda, uh, then who was the Vice Chancellor of the Kenyatta University, thought that there needs to be a way in which to bring uh, students to start thinking about being job creators as opposed to just seek job seekers. And I was, I was part of the group that joined the Chandari Innovation Center uh, right from its concept stage. And we made a case that was strong enough to arrange uh, for donors to come and, and help us build the, or rather help the university to build the center that is, and which has also come to host the uh, Young African Leadership Initiative. But back in the day, I was building those marketplaces that I was talking about. And one of the challenges that I realized was, in as much as you have this creative technology platform, without the underlying infrastructure, um, the people that you're targeting or the people you're hoping to, to help will not manage to come on board. For instance, at that particular time, I, I was building the Maasai market.com, which, uh, which was supposed to take the, the regular Maasai market, which you see uh, that has different marketplaces every other, every other day. And we were trying to bring all these curios onto an online platform where customers could be able to buy uh, through the internet. And we thought the market is abroad. The market is, is quite big. It's not geographically, uh, there's no geographical barrier with regards to curios and art. And, art. and so we thought, let's build a platform then on, and on board these particular vendors. Now, the shock on the ground was that not so many people had smartphones on that day. And also data was quite expensive. And like now where we have uh, 4G internet, now you can imagine you have your Melita Muizi and you're trying to log on or to try and understand the concept of WhatsApp. Let's just put it uh, for that, uh, in that instance. So it was a technology platform that could provide or could, could catalyze um, the, the growth of the handcraft space. However, it was also um, limited in terms of uh, it was also limited in terms of um, the, the targeted users and what their capability were in terms of accessing this. And so my joining the Young Africa Leadership Initiative really was to first of all uh, go through, and, and, and this is pretty much what I, uh, I came to learn because I joined the business cohort. It was through the design thinking uh, curriculum that then I got to actually understand why um, my solutions were not built for the target audience that I was, I was hoping you know, to solve. And so the, the Young Africa Leadership Program in, introduced the whole concept of, uh, of design thinking where you, you come up with an idea, then take it to the market and, you know, ask real, uh, for real feedback from the people who will inten intentionally become your users. And so what that uh, enabled us to do was to crystallize and, you know, to step, take a step back and think, Maybe what we've been building was a bit early for the market. Right? And was there another way in which you could, you know, uh, navigate around this? Um, for all of us who, who, who came in when, all of us who came in when um, Facebook was just starting, Facebook used to be the biggest social network. And I believe for Gen Zs, um, where we, have, we are now seeing TikTok, we are also seeing, um, especially the, the Gen Zs are mainly on TikTok. They are mainly also on, on Snapchat and the like. But just back in the day, it was mainly Facebook. And so we, uh, and the first thing that we did was just to put up then a Facebook page. And out of that Facebook page, up to today, we still receive calls from people who are looking to connect with market, uh, with the market. And, um, and so in essence, Yali helped us think through our business model and also come about uh, new other, other new innovate, uh, innovations that uh, not only then got funded uh, through some of the initiatives at Yali um, and with other partners such as the United States African Development Foundation uh, came up with. And I believe uh, for this generation, um, what, what my core message would be, um, as you also been, um, and, and, and you know, it's, it's also in the backstop that during this COVID era, we've seen TikTok rise to, the, uh, to, to become one of the, if not the biggest uh, social media. And who, the people who are, who are out here making the most uh, in terms of um, influence by way of them being influencers um, are, the, are the Generation Z. But then if, if, not, if you're not intentional about the kind of messaging that you're pushing out there, then you might just be a passing trend that over time gets forgotten and the next person will come and replace you. So my main question, my main question to, 
to his generation Z would be what is that niche that you 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 have identified that you can speak to and speak with authority and even as you grow the fan side of your of your following then they need to also remember you for championing something you can pick anything from the SDG uh, 17 point it can be about uh, creating decent uh, work or economic growth and champion the the voices of those who are trying to do this and basically there are quite a lot of opportunities there i hope uh, kevin have answered your question with regards to my involvement with the ali Perfect. Uh, very much uh, in order, uh, uh, Stanley. Uh, thank you for actually uh, even uh, going way ahead of our conversations and uh, probably uh, uh, just lighting uh, key areas into which Generation Z can uh, embrace. But uh, uh, you've also brought in uh, the larger component of uh, leveraging up on uh, uh, the YALI programs and uh, the MWF programs and uh, all uh, programs that uh, has enabled you, me, uh, Felicia and uh, Mudoni to connect. And uh, probably at this particular juncture, it will be a perfect time to uh, bring in, uh, uh, I indicated uh, her on my script as uh, our big system uh, because uh, she plays a critical role of uh, leading and driving uh, the center, which actually accorded us uh, the opportunity of also being on this particular platform. Uh, ladies and uh, gents, allow me to bring unto you uh, Madam Betty. Betty, probably this is a chance for you to just come and uh, uh, shower us with uh, all the great uh, insights that uh, probably you have as a person and uh, why RLC is, uh, in, uh, uh, is a special uh, component and a tool onto which young people can leverage on. Uh, Betty, go ahead, please. How are you and good morning once again. Okay, good morning, everyone. And thank you, Kevin. Um, happy to be here. My name is Betty Getahi, and I am the Deputy Chief of Party at Young African Leaders Initiative based out of Nairobi. And we draw participants aged 18 to 35 years uh, from across 14 countries. And the special thing about the Young African Leaders Initiative is that we build a, the leadership skills of young people around an ecosystem that recognizes the need for having a business environment a civic leadership environment and a public management environment because businesses need the government to thrive, they need also the civic a space to survive. So having said that, um, we normally have participants sitting for about four weeks at the center, after which they become uh, YALI alumni and they become ambassadors, like the ones you see on the screen this morning, and thanks to all of you. And these ambassadors or the YALI alumni and different sectors, quite a, a variety of sectors. We currently have about 4,400, and naturally they have um, segregated themselves into specific sectors such as health, education, energy, agribusiness, to tech, to entertainment and media like Mogoni, to oil and gas, international trade and business. And so we have young people being able to use their leadership skills to, to drive businesses in the various sectors. So for us to be able to run this kind of program, we have needed good uh, collaborations with a strategic partners such as USAID and Massacre Foundation. We currently also work with uh, IntelliCup who have given us this platform this morning. And we also are looking into places like uh, investments for these businesses. Having come from a place where we have supported young businesses to the place of startups, so they started off and now they hoping to scale. If I look at uh, Big Cuckoo, when they get to the place of scaling, then we look at investments. And so in this case, then we start, we continue looking for partners that are going to uh, help us in terms of technical assistance. It could be also co-funding. It could also be that they help with the curriculum. It could also be that they expose us to different networks. So that's what it takes to run this kind of program as much as we also see uh, partners who would like to work in specific sectors, for example, energy, we have a random program, for example, called Women in African uh, Power, so they were especially power engineers or power um, practitioners from across Africa, so we have different um, packages for different organizations as we all hope to be counted for an Africa that is skilled up for 2050. Thank you, Kevin. 
Thank you very much, uh, uh, Betty, for uh, bringing in that particular clarity in terms of what uh, the Young Africa Leadership Initiative is all about. And uh, once again, uh, thank you again for integrating us into this particular uh, platform that has been uh, anchored uh, by Sanclip. Uh, to maybe just uh, first track this uh, conversation uh, further to any participant just uh, uh, joining in at this particular minute, this uh, particular session objective is uh, set at looking at uh, how the next generation of business and business leaders in a post-COVID world should conduct themselves. And uh, maybe just uh, uh, taking lessons and uh, cues in terms of how we can tie the shift in business and uh, explore ways of working uh, in the post-pandemic. And uh, joining us on this particular panel is uh, Felicia Masaki from uh, Tanzania Leading and Social Enterprise uh, called uh, Mimi Ninani. We also have uh, Mudoni uh, Waigwa, a creative entrepreneur with an entity called uh, Nifty Works Plus, and also Stanley Guitar, who is the Chief Executive Officer at Big Kuku. And uh, also on our set is uh, Betty Karioki, who is the Deputy Chief of Party, Yali East Africa. I thought really uh, we're going to have time. I see probably uh, some uh, minutes are ticking in. Allow me to go back to um, uh, Felicia, who brought in the element of how best we can unleash our creativity and our potential in, uh, in various ways. But uh, in this particular uh, segment, uh, maybe uh, two questions, uh, Felicia. You could explore them in uh, any way uh, that you wish to. How have you leveraged up on uh, leadership platforms, right? And uh, in this uh, context, Felicia, you could uh, uh, maybe uh, bring key highlights in terms of uh, Mimi Ninani is a platform that uh, offers leadership sessions. How is it? And uh, bearing in mind right now, yes, you're leading an entity that uh, shares across leadership sh sessions. How do you go about it, okay? But also in the process, will you maybe uh, just uh, bring in uh, the challenges that uh, you encounter while uh, pushing and leading an entity such as uh, Mimi Ninani? Felicia, please uh, uh, take it away. Thank you so much, uh, Kevins and, and everyone. It's been an enjoyable uh, conversation. And um, just straight to the question, I, I, I would say entrepreneurship is such a lonely journey. <laughs> it can get tough. <laughs> it can, it can get really tough. And, and, uh, because as you start, you have this passion, you can have this vision so big and, and now bringing together the right resources. It's like, it's the ambition is not enough to get you going. You need to have everything in place. So it's a learning process. And really, uh, it's, it's not quite common for everybody, like to have all the knowledge. Even if you have everything together, the practice is quite different. So I remember when I started the journey, <laughs> I, I was very passionate. I had this, you know, this vision documented and this is how I'll go every step and things like that. But really getting into practical <laughs> process it's like everything had to to completely uh, change to kind of now go with what is there so uh programs like yali my encounter with it was just a profound experience for me because now it made me feel that i am not alone in this in this um area of entrepreneurship but also meeting with other passionate like-minded people who are also doing amazing things for the continent for their countries, for their communities, it was really, really uh, inspiring and motivating for me to really not look at my challenges as barriers, but rather you know, as, 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 as opportunities to kind of be innovative, to break through and things like that. So, um, we need that knowledge. So in terms of, of getting the knowledge, uh, uh, Stanley has talked about design thinking. So that really helped me to look at the user, you know, in as much as you have this solutions, ideas, the user is your core person. You have to understand that person and and really think about uh, how now you can d devise solutions based on on that and their experiences and their evolution. So really, that humbled me and kind of helped me. But also, um, I would also touch on um, the, the 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 packaging, like the way um, Yali programs are, the curriculum itself. Because I'm also in the in the sector where I'm also. Uh, providing knowledge and 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 programs to these young individuals uh, or professionals, so it really helped me to how I package my content, and I realized that 
uh, there's a lot that you can share. There's a lot you can, you can, you know, you can learn, not just the, you can have the content, but how you package it, how you bring different facilitators, how you bring the exposure aspect of it. So there was a lot that I learned from how, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the institute is, 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 is programmed, how the process goes and things like that in terms of programming. And, and I kind of learned that. But also Mimi Ninani has acted as a bridge in terms of, um, you know, Yali exposed me to these networks and opportunities. So it was like a ladder to help me um, get into uh, knowing all these uh, opportunities in the ecosystem in terms of funding opportunities, in terms of um, networks, people to collaborate with, uh, a lot of opportunities. And then I might not need to use them by myself or my team, but also there are a lot of young people behind me who are benefiting from the organization but do not have the exposure to these opportunities so that helped me now to not just be the the, the one to kind of uh, providing skill sets but also to be as a bridge or a channel of these opportunities to these um, individuals that I work with so that really helped uh, to kind of now you know bring more exposure so and 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 from that I've been into a lot of other leadership uh, programs uh and 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 it has made my mind because these things also shift your mindset you need the knowledge you need the the, the skill sets you need to you need the networks so the more you learn the skills the more you adapt people will share a lot of things that will kind of make your mind open-minded and ready to kind of just accumulate a lot of uh information and adjust quickly you know and and so that improves the strategy improves your the talent you're working with improves a lot of things so you, you just find yourself you're not the same and and then you you're exploring into these new opportunities and you, you your confidence improves and you become more daring to these things so that is i would say yeah in, in a nutshell so much um uh, benefits and uh, even i'm in this platform because of that um the next <laughs> question was what was the next question sorry kevin Around the challenges uh, um, probably uh the challenges uh, you've encountered and uh, how you've uh, maneuvered around it oh wow yeah so <laughs> i would say i think maybe i've it's it's a lot of uh, challenges i would say as i said it's it's a journey uh but for us it's like um challenge it's like we give ourselves time to i and my team when i say we uh to to kind of process because sometimes you can be so immersed into the work that you forget to get yourself out of the business and look at it. So I would say those breaks really help where we kind of just take ourselves out of the business and look at it. So things like uh, sustainability. So you find that you, we, like in terms of financial sustainability, uh, developing business models that can really work. So <laughs> you, you just have to constantly evaluate yourself what you do and 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 and, and you, you evaluate your target group you evaluate the market so we do consistent uh, sessions where we just brainstorm together with the team we kind of evaluate our impact we have a lot of uh, feedback sessions and things like that so i would say um, um when we do that we just look at, at challenges in that perspective in terms of it's it's a way to to innovate as a way to create. So things like um, we talked about the COVID uh, scene uh, where it happened and we had all our programs for the year in person programs. So now we're looking like now we are stuck. It's lockdowns. How do we navigate through it? So now we had to engage our participants to kind of ask them how are they going through the COVID uh, season and what kind of programs would they like and how would we uh, do them with them. Should it, should we do it online? Which platforms is it? Zoom? Is it Microsoft Teams? Is it WhatsApp? So things like that. So we engage them and learn how they're, they're going through and, and what kind of, um, engagements and platforms and channels. And then from there, we kind of now package ourselves accordingly to kind of have that, uh, connection. So that's been, uh, our approach to different, um, challenges that we go through. So it's just a way to kind of, take a pause and look at how differently can we uh, approach that. But I would say, um, yeah, that's, that's. 
All right. Uh, thank you for that. As uh, Felicia takes a pause right there and uh, she'll be coming back with the uh, parting shots as we conclude. Allow me to transition that pause and uh, bring in up uh, Mudoni. Uh, from uh, a creative uh, perspective, uh, what keeps you up to date? How you've leveraged up on these particular platforms, Mudoni? And uh, probably also uh, in the process as a woman in business, uh, some of the challenges uh, you face within the creative sector and how do you navigate uh, across the Mudoni? Thank you so much, Kevin. You know, Felicia mentioned something so important. The entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship journey is so lonely. And in that process, you can get really demotivated and you may start not believing in your pursuits and, you know, in your, in your vision and why you started this journey of entrepreneurship. So such programs like Yali, when I went in, it's one of those moments where you something was unlocked in me where I felt I'm not I'm not pursuing an audacious dream that cannot be achieved I'm not thinking some wild dream that that cannot be realized because you're interacting with like-minded young people who are also building their businesses who are also in governance who are also in the civic space but it's such a conducive and supportive environment that makes you realize that actually I can do this. And it really um, boosts the conf your confidence and really shifts your mindset. Because as entrepreneurs, as we build our businesses and as we lead our teams, we are the ones who are taking them through a journey that they aren't going to know about it because you are ahead, you're pioneering. And so if you don't believe in yourself, your team is not going to believe in you. So Yali really, the curriculum really made all individuals and myself included really confident in what we're doing, equipped us with the right tools and made us bold into stepping out into the world and be the leaders that we are. You know, sometimes we don't believe we're leaders because life really hits us hard, but in fact, we are leaders in our own spaces. So Yali, gave me the, the boost to just say, Modoni, you can do this. And with that, I learned the importance of also building networks and building a community. So as a woman entrepreneur, one of the challenges that we face is we don't get access to the supply chain. We don't get access to procurement um, opportunities. So one of the initiatives that the UN did was or is called Sheet Rates. So it's creating a network of women entrepreneurs who can network and who can be given access to the private sector, to governments, so that they can participate in the procurement um, process. Why is it important that women participate in the procurement process? It's so that when we are bidding, when we're putting in our tenders, when we are putting in our proposals for creative work, we are part of the process. We are given an opportunity to play in the value chain. So another challenge that women face is access to funding. Yes, we go to the bank. Yes, we go to these different places. But as a young woman, I don't have collateral. So how do we find opportunities within this ecosystem that can help us stay afloat, that can help us um, achieve our visions? So Supportive systems and programs like Yali or Sheet Rates or any other business support organizations are really integral in helping women entrepreneurs pursue their visions and pursue their, their dreams. So for a young person, you know, sometimes they may feel that they don't have a voice, but I just want to tell each individual youth who's listening here that you do have a voice and you do have a space in this world. But the question is, are you taking the initiative? Yes, we can say that you should have an opportunity. Yes, we can say that you want to start a business, you want to have a job, but are you taking the initiative? And it's looking for opportunities in your neighborhood, in your community, because I know Yali does outreach programs when there's an application run, they go to different parts of the country at county level and just reaching out to different youth for them to apply. So as a young person, are you applying to these things? Yes, we say Gen Z is different from us, but sincerely at the core of it all, 
we all want to be heard and we all want to be seen. So what role are you playing in that space? So my challenge or my charge to the young people in this conversation is, are you taking the initiative? No one can force you. It has to come from within. Thank you, Madoni. No one can force you. It has to come from you uh, as in it has to come from you as, uh, as an individual. Um, Madoni just exploring also some of the opportunities that do exist uh, uh, within uh, uh, within the ecosystem that uh, she is in. She's mentioned she trade. Uh, she's uh, also uh, mentioned, of course, uh, uh, the platform that was also linked us to this particular opportunity. That's uh, Yali, which is uh, a good one. I know I am uh, like two minutes off uh, away from time. Uh, team Elsie, probably if you could just acquire uh, uh, five minutes to wrap this up but uh, uh, coming in uh, next uh, Stanley I will uh, probably uh, ask you to uh, specifically uh, in a bit of a natural focus on the challenges how's it been uh, I mean uh, you pushing up an agro uh, processing uh, product then uh, we'll come to uh, Betty with uh, probably just key perspectives in terms of uh, what it takes uh, to run a leadership program such as the RLC then I uh, will come uh, back with the uh, if uh, we are uh, Gen Z, eh, uh, what do you need to tell them? I mean, yes, uh, we tend to differentiate ourselves from them, but uh, if at all what them, what will you tell them? So Stano, in uh, that particular ad uh, order, please take it away. Stanley, challenges uh, you faced, have you mitigated uh, through them? Then uh, we'll uh, get to uh, Betty. Yeah, sure. Go ahead, Stanley. Um, so one of the biggest challenges that we face is in, in building infrastructure, you need heavy capital investments. Um, the amount of money that you have to deploy uh, is quite significant because when you look at coal, uh, a cold storage uh, facility, for instance, it goes about $15,000 to $20,000. And so it becomes quite a, a, a bit of a challenge if you as a farmer want to have a cold storage for your chicken, then you have to also consider how much it costs to set up a processing uh, facility because then the chicken has to be slaughtered in a designated location. Then you have to also to look at the legal challenges that you must face and you must address them based on, you know, uh, how, you, how well you're able to invest. So in a nutshell, uh, the biggest challenges, as, uh, as Mogoni mentioned, was access to funding. As a young person, you, have, you don't have as much collateral as, uh, as you may want to be able to go to a bank and secure a facility that can help you build a processing facility or invest in your cold chain or invest in your logistical solutions. So that's where partners such as IntelliCup and, and the partners that you know, SunCup is able to mobilize. And with partnerships such as the ones that you're building with uh, the Young Africa Leadership Initiative, there should be a way in which you're able to tap into this capital um, and to be able to showcase what it is that you're able to do. Uh, one of the things that Generation Z needs to understand is as, as we were there, um, we were young ones, and we, there are so many challenges that we've gone along uh, the journey. And there are common pitfalls that you can avoid in your journey up today, based on the information that uh, you, you will be shared based on the conversations that you have with alumni and these organizations. My charge to Sanka and, and, and the people that are listening in uh, on the investor side, uh, look into organizations such as the YALI, look into the MWF network, uh, the entire YALI network, look and see what kind of businesses you can uh, invest in. Some, some do not need uh, as, as much capital to start with, but they do need the capital, especially when you're building um, uh, around, along the, the you know, uh, infrastructure bit of it. Great, uh, Stanley. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, uh, Betty, probably uh, a second or uh, some, um, uh, a few highlights in terms of what it takes to uh, run a leadership program as uh, RLC and uh, maybe uh, what you will require to ensure that uh, it's uh, sustainable. Okay, thank you, Kevin. So uh, you realize as, as Africa, we have an enormous task to support a very huge population of young people to access opportunity, be it jobs or entrepreneurship or enterprises. And so it takes collaboration of organizations, uh, some of them being funders, or that's the development community. We also need institutions uh, like Kenyatta University, where the YALI program is currently housed. We need the private sector, the likes of IntelliCAP and uh, financial institutions and others that will not only give us um, funding, but they give us technical support and they also probably give opportunities for young people that we work with. We also need investors in this case um, 
be it angel investors, be it other potential investors that can then help us scale these initiatives to go forward. I mean, definitely a youth uh, that is willing to do the work, like Udoni said, because it's, it takes the initiative. And that's why leadership is, is a big component of what we believe in, because it takes leadership, which is self-leadership, leadership at community level, and eventually leadership at continent and globally. So uh, we, we call upon partners who would like to work with us uh, to probably grow what they are working on in their institutions, uh, to support more young people uh, in whichever way those organizations can support. Um, and like I mentioned, there's TA, there's also uh, investment, there's also just being able to collaborate with us to enrich the curriculum as we hope to, again, participate in the next level of African uh, skill building for 2015. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, thank you, Betty. So I had asked earlier on, uh, envisioning that you're all Generation Z, uh, right? Uh, so you're Gen Z. Uh, how cool is Mimi Ninani? I mean, you remember when we were just chatting uh, the other day, I indicated, uh, 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 I mean, uh, will you be that colleague who uh, Gen Z will come and say, ah, Falisha is of good vibes. Uh, uh, Stano's, uh, uh, Stanley's uh, agro-processing plant is uh, a good vibe beat. Um, the only uh, uh, creative enterprise is a good vibe. Any party shots uh, for the Gen Zs uh, who could uh, maybe be uh, listening in, uh, what will you tell them? Uh, in um, maybe briefly 30 seconds each in uh, no particular way as we wrap this up. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Uh, I would say a lot is changing. <laughs> a lot is changing with our generations, but I would say that um, I think uh, whether it's a Generation Z, a millennial, there are things that really uh, are the foundations or at the core that I would recommend for you know for just a person to consider that you know they they kind of ground them. And one of them is the is the growth mindset to kind of cultivate a growth mindset that really. Uh, helps one to kind of have an outlook in life that kind of uh, steers more of uh, looking at opportunities, more of perseverance. Because crisis is 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 is, is you no know, is like we had COVID. What uh, helps other people to kind of sustain that or not is that mindset, the kind of mindset that is 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 looks at at problems as opportunities and find a way to go out, uh, um, uh, you know, around it. But also another thing is building character. So. If if uh, I would I would urge for Generation Z or any anyone to just focus on uh, character building and and most importantly on the values that ground people. So what are the things about you that will not change over time? You know, are you, are you can you be trustworthy? Uh, are you creative and things like that? So have a set of values that you want to work by. And whether you're working at home, you're working in the office, <laughs> you have a family, or you're a single person, but things that people can know you for and trust you with and will not really uh, change uh, who you are over generations, you know, and those define organizations um, and, and people. So as you're focusing on thriving businesses, building thriving businesses, we also should focus on building thriving personalities or thriving character, thriving people as people and even investors, I think they're looking to invest not just on the business, but the person behind it. And what is that character that you're working to build? So those are the things that I would say. All right, uh, building character and uh, investors are looking for character powerful enough. Uh, Mudoni, uh, any um, bits, uh, parting shots, uh, uh, keep it uh, brief uh, for the Gen Zs in uh, uh, any particular way you feel like, Mudoni? For Gen Zs, it's okay to dream. You know, sometimes we may share our dreams and the people around us are just like, what are you talking about? I don't understand. So as guardians, as mentors, as parents, as friends who are older than the Gen Zs, let's encourage them to pursue their dreams. Let's connect them to the right people. Let's connect them to the opportunities. Because there's one thing that people usually say about Africa. We like to keep information to ourselves. We like to hoard information. Let's share information. Let's connect people because we are all within an ecosystem, investors, mentors, um, collaborators, entrepreneurs, and the Gen Zs. How can we all find linkages and support one another? Because we can't do this alone. The Gen Z has a dream, but they don't have access to 
funding. They don't have access to these leadership programs. How do we connect them? So I think it's very important that we seek to build partnerships and collaborations so that we have thriving businesses, we have a thriving community, and we have a thriving ecosystem because we are not islands, we can only do it together. Great, we're not islands, you can only do it together, linking it up to the power of uh, character. Stanley from uh, an agro-processing beta, any parting shot, 30 seconds please for the Gen Zs? I think for me, it's, you need to be very curious about uh, life. Uh, be curious to learn as much as you can. Be curious to, as long as someone is offering something out there, seek to understand what it is that they're offering. If it's such a program such as Yali, um, get into it, get involved, get to learn. And at the end of the day, that curiosity will be able to give you something that you never had and it will probably drive you for the next uh, you know, couple of years. Uh, thank you, Kevin, for the chance. Thank you very much, Stanley. Uh, be curious enough, uh, be courageous, uh, be a person of uh, greater uh, character. Um, Betty, probably uh, you could uh, sum it up for us and uh, we'll uh, come back with our virtual uh, uh, close-up. Uh, right, Betty, please. Um, for me, I would say speak to organizations here uh, that I hope that you can start to be counted once again, that you have supported uh, this enormous youth population to access opportunity uh, across Africa and globally. And you do that by working with organizations such as ourselves. And so we look forward to speaking with more of you. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you. That's been uh, an incredible uh, conversation that has been brought to you there by some club, uh, co-curated by the Young African Leadership Initiative uh, East Africa. And maybe at this particular instance, I'll want to task uh, our big sister, Madame Betty. Betty, this picture is for you, right? Uh, pull up your camera. So our two fingers in the sky, Betty is going to take this picture as we close, right? Um, like, just give me a second. Uh, a second. Yay! So, Betty, I'm not seeing your two fingers in the sky. Let me help you. So, there it is, uh, the two fingers in the sky. And that's how probably we close this particular session up. Let me see. One, two, three. All right. So, we do it. Thank you so much, people, for making this possible. Thank you, Sunclub, for making actually uh, us be present on this particular segment. My name is Bin Kevin. Sir, Randiek on this particular platform has been Falishia Masaki Mutoni. Uh, and uh, uh, Madam Betty from uh, the Young African Leadership uh, Initiative, uh, Deputy Chief of Party. And that's how we close it up. Uh, over to you, uh, Elsie, and uh, it's been a pleasure uh, doing this. Uh, Elsie? Elsie? Um... Hi, Gavin. Hi, Gavin. I think I was talking on mute. Uh, right. Thank you so much for this session that has been. Uh, yes, uh, for the moderators even that we've had and the speakers, uh, good job, guys. If you want to link with any of them, uh, you can check on the chat box. Uh, they've sent most of the LinkedIn handles. So, yeah, thank you so much, Kevin. Thank you, too, for uh, having us. It's a pleasure to have yourselves a great day ahead, uh, team. Much appreciated.